super excited to have you here. Shane is excited too. He's just like working a lot. I'm a little sleepy, but we're gonna get through it. Um, I must say, what do, what do they call it when, when people dress up like characters? There's actually a word for it. Cosplay. Uh, there you go. Costume. Costume play. And it's awesome. Look at this. Jeez. Wow. No, the, the one thing in a cursory evaluation uh, has yet to be concluded. The, the cosplay people here are, are hotter than <laughs> the LA. So, I don't know, this is like a little hidden gem over here. Of course, I still consider Long Beach to be Los Angeles. <laughs> it's a. Uh... Yeah, last time I was in Long Beach, we shot a film here called Kiss Kiss Bang Bang. <laughs> and we used the freeway. And they said, use the freeway, but if you put Long Beach in the sign, we'll let you use it for free. As though somehow we would. Uh... Encourage people to move to Long Beach or something by creating a movie. So we got the freeway for free, and uh, it's just a, it was a great experience. How you how you doing today? Are you? This is a great con, right? I mean, Long Beach has just put, pulled it together this year and just made it awesome. We're really excited, and we're we're just excited that Shane agreed to come here. I took a chance and just asked him to come, and he said yes, and I was like, really awesome. <laughs> I was so excited because. You know, I love Iron Man, it's one of my favorite comics, and Shane taking it over is like the best thing ever, I think, in my life. Yeah, I, uh, <laughs> I truly grew up with this stuff. Um, nice. I think there's a lot to be said. There's a sense of people out there looking up to, you know, the sort of the professions, whether it be the artists who draw, or the filmmakers or the writers. Say, you know, wow, that's like the other side of the coin. It's the same side of the coin, really, because I was that kid in high school who would come home without friends at the end of the school day and just sort of buy all the comedy albums I could get, the weird, obscure ones like the, you know, Franklin and Jai, who no one ever heard of, all the Carlins, all the, and just go up in my room, close the door by myself, and laugh my ass off listening to comedy albums. And that was my social life. So comic books, isolation to some extent, and just intense and never-ending ingestation of all this kind of uh, adventure story input. My life was, was living out other people's adventure stories, from Burroughs, uh, through to Theodore Sturgeon, through to, you know, the 70s when they had all those, the Executioner, and the Destroyer, and the Snapper, and the Ripper, and the, it was all, uh, it was all leading up to something. So, as much as I used to be ashamed of the fact that I spent so much time alone, two good things come of it. One, I'm no longer ashamed to be alone. All right. No. I can spend endless time alone. There are people on this planet who, if you said, I'm gonna put you in a room for a year with nothing but books, and you can't see or talk to anyone, they, they would literally melt down, oh God. <laughs> I'd say, oh great, I'll see you in a year. You know? The other great thing is that all that input just gestates and it makes a stew and it kind of ferments over the years until eventually the end product is you make something. You make a movie, you make a graphic novel, you make a novel or a comic book. And how many artists do we have here? There you go. People draw. How many writers want to come out of it? Okay, good. Nice. How many just put couch potato consumers? There you go. Yes. <laughs> I'm all of the above. Well, that was actually, you kind of set me up. I was going to ask you sort of about your origin into comics and, and where you got into comics and, and what your favorite comics were. Yeah. I'll tell you a story. Good. <clears throat> like stories. <laughs> um, I'll tell you the story about the comic book that, that started me writing. Because it was the first time I understood, A, the concept of setups and payoffs in storytelling. And also, it was one of the first times to understand the power of a simple story, in this case, a four-page comic book. It was a little, and I think it was in Creepy or Eerie magazine. Does anyone remember those? Yeah, yes. the war magazines. I'll tell you the story and how it affected me. The first panel is of this hand coming out of the earth. And this zombie, this creature, is really tall, starts to lump around in the grave and it stands up. And it's this hulking, 
getting a zombie, and it starts to walk, and it walks towards this house on the hill, and we see there's a light in the window. And the thing's rotting, so its brain is kind of decayed, but it still has little flashes of, of, of cogent thought, and each of those is a panel, and we just see little blips of its life. Like the father beating his child because he was born sort of deformed and, and mentally retarded. And so he's in the corner, the kid's clutching that teddy bear, and the father's just wailing on him, and then the mother's screaming and they're shoving. Now he's gotten big and bulky and ungainly. And you see that in his life they treated him so horribly that they accidentally killed him because they beat him too hard. And you say to yourself, oh, zombie, come out of the grave, he's going to get revenge. So he gets to the house on the hill and uh, breaks in and the parents still live there. And the father's older than we saw him in the panel earlier, but he comes out and screams and they have a fight and the father gets shoved aside and he goes down the stairs and breaks his neck. And the mother comes out with a shotgun, and the zombie kind of pulls the gun aside, and it goes off and shoots her head off. And he stands on the steps, and you think, wow, he just got revenge against his parents. Except the zombie doesn't stop there. He keeps walking down the hall upstairs into his old room, and he gets his teddy bear. And the last panel is him back pulling the dirt in over himself and leaning back with his bear, because now he can sleep. And he has his... And I just thought, oh, Jesus, God, that was just so powerful for me when I was a little kid. And that's four pages of the comic book. And here I am as a kid in tears over this zombie with his teddy bear going back to bed. So that really was the impetus for me to say, even at this level, even at this kind of comic book level of presentation, there's a potential for a tremendous dramatic story to be told. And far too few uh, live up to that, but the good ones are great. Who are the, who are the greats right now? Who's great? Right now? Yeah, who, who's the great? Who's great? Morris. Grant Morris, of course. Morris. Matt Fraction. Matt Fraction's great, yeah. Ben. Ben. <coughs> hmm? ben. Neil Gaiman. Yeah, of course he did. Okay. Um, Jeff Jones. There you go. <laughs> so, so who are your favorites? Uh, who do you love? Who are your favorite authors? Because Shane has an enormous amount of books in his house. Um, his own library as well. So, um. It's funny because even as a kid I knew that like Marv Wolfman was good but Jerry Conway wasn't. You know? Is Marv here? <laughs> <laughs> he, he might be here. So, I, I, was, I was with him a few minutes ago. So. I loved um, Peter O'Donnell, Modesty Blades. I got a big kick out of that. I don't know if you've ever read it. But um, <clears throat> The trend that I see missing is sophistication. Um, there was a period when comic, it, it's kind of paradoxical because of the, when comic books started selling a million copies per issue with uh, image comics. Right. And my neighbor in Fullerton, California, where they just kicked this poor man to death, the cops, uh, was Rob Liefeld. And Rob Liefeld said, hey man, come over to my house, you know. Uh, 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 here, read some of my comics. They sell a million dollars, a million copies of, per, per issue. They sucked. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't even, you didn't know where you were. There was just like space floor. There was floor. And then you turn, okay, now there's, I guess that's a wall. And they just all had muscles and tits. There was just all you and they all look the same. It's like, you would draw and go, she's not done yet. Tits. Oh, sorry. Right. And then, she, yeah, now she's done. And I, I just think that's awful. And you. you get into things like Hellblazer, mm. where you see more you know, sort of nuance. And I've always wanted that. I wonder, why can't you do a comic where they don't have that guy with muscles, you know? Ah, and then I discovered my guy. <laughs> Iron Man, of course. Yeah. So, so tell, tell us, since Shane is directing Iron Man 3, and we're all very excited about that, how, how did that come to, to happen? I mean, did you like Iron Man before? I mean, um, you is know, this a comic you're familiar with? I knew Iron Man very, I, I actually said to uh, my roommate about 10 years ago, because he said, well, they haven't done Iron Man yet, they're just doing Spider-Man now. I said, they'll never do Iron Man. <laughs> I, I didn't think they'd ever do Iron Man either. Yeah, it was a character nobody sort of knew, really. He's a, he, he's a print, sort of 1% ass bite, you know, and, and drinks too much, and, 
And it's just an iron costume, and how interesting is that to have a clunky guy behind a mask? Of course, I was coming off a TV movies like Auto Man. Oh, <laughs> wow. Yeah. Throwback. <laughs> so, but they decided to do this, and so Downey and Favreau would come to my house, um, and they said, we need your help. <laughs> I said, well, I, I, I don't think I can do it. And we talked for a few days, and that was the extent of my participation in Iron Man 1, which we talked for a few days. Um, I don't remember making a contribution to that movie. I remember talking and, and not seeing that it actually prompted any actual decisions in terms of the finished film, but they came to me and said, you were so helpful. <laughs> <laughs> And I said, any time, you know. <laughs> yeah, those free shoes, yeah. Um, so here it was. We ended up doing Kiss Kiss Bang Bang. The second Iron Man um, <clears throat> did, did really well. In the box office. In the box office. And, <laughs> but for some reason, John Favreau had a decision to make and chose not to do the third one. And I, I don't know what happened. I wish I could give you the inside dish that there was a falling out. Uh, I don't actually, my feeling is there wasn't a falling out. It just one of these weird things where it didn't happen and Favreau took another offer. And I, I think that because I know that Downey and Favreau are still uh, you know, really close friends. Um, so Robert called me, that's how it, he called me and said, you know, I. Uh, <clears throat> the big plans for you. <laughs> and uh, I had trepidation at first. I had a smaller movie that I was trying to do. And, uh, you know, Iron, Iron Man required writing the entire script. But I said, well, let, me, let me really address this because this could be the shot in the arm I need. I fell off the map for a while. I, uh, you know, I made a splash when I started my career very young, like age 22. Leave 11. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so hard. And then for a while, I guess, you know, I'll talk about it later if you like, but the circumstances just sort of pushed me out of the picture and I sort of slid off the map. But this, this looked good, this Iron Man, so I thought about it and thought about it. And then they said, well, we've got this other writer. I said, what do you, what, what do you mean? I said, I'm, I'm going to write and direct it. He said, well, this other guy, Drew, you know, we're Marvel and we're very cheap. <laughs> and we wouldn't pay you if we didn't have to. Uh, but this guy, Drew, owes us another movie, so we want to roll him over onto this and get a draft out of him. And I said, okay. all of a sudden, I read in the paper, like, Drew Pierce writing Iron Man. So I went to, that, I went to work and said, you guys, you went to fucking, he's British for Christ's sake. <laughs> And I said, just, just give him a chance. So it ended up, what happened was this amazing uh, collaboration and friendship with this absolutely lovely British writer named Drew Pierce, who sat with me for weeks and weeks in my house with my dog farting at her feet. And, uh, <laughs> um, wow, it, it was just, it was so much fun. So, you know, now Drew's doing Sherlock Holmes 3.